Also, welcome to our eighth lecture. Um, this is going to focus on faults. We uh, discussed last time about uh, the definitions of faults. Now, faults are really important in general uh, in any part of uh, uh, geological sciences. Uh, Yes, uh, I am. Uh, la grabación está en curso, uh, Gabriel. Sí. And um, what we are going to discuss is a bit about terminology. So we have a lot about terminology here. You'll see in the textbooks and the types of faults, and then a bit about their anatomy what we talk about when we talk about fault displacement what that is then fault formation something about earthquakes um so you'll see all these aspects yeah uh it's less than what these chapters contain uh but enough to to give you um the basics yeah for for uh, this topic and we are going to see more geology as well. So we are going to see less of, you know, uh, rock mechanics that we discussed and more geology. So I hope that you will enjoy this more. Um, <clears throat> so here uh, I took from a different source, but I think it's pretty in a, a short text. Uh, a lot is said. Yeah. So the idea is that uh, he says here, if we are to describe faults, yeah, and uh, the idea with the faults is uh, what type of movement we have parallel to the uh, fault plane. Is it along the deep of this plane? Yeah, so we can call them deep slip. Or is it uh, horizontal, a horizontal uh, movement along the fault plane? And that, then it's strike slip. Yeah, and we have all the possibilities in between, which is oblique slip. Yeah, so it has a component along deep and one along the strike. Um, now, when we talk about uh, deep slip faults, uh, if it's along the deep, normally uh, the the fault plane is inclined. Yeah, so you have an upper part and the lower part, and you have an uh, the upper part is the hanging wall block, and the lower part is the foot wall block. Yeah, so foot wall, so that is you know the base if you want, and hanging wall is above. Um, and if the hanging wall moves down, then you have a normal fault. Now, if it moves up relative to the foot wall, then you have a reverse fault. Yeah. Um, now here, let's have a look at these pictures. Yeah. So uh, these pictures, what they show, um, they show here. Um, this is an escarpment. An escarpment, you see. Um, and it says there is an uplift on of the northern side of the North Anatolian fault in Turkey. Now, when we will discuss tectonics, you will you will hear more about the North Anatolian fault in Turkey, which is a major strike slip fault, which causes <laughs> causes a lot of problems in terms uh, that uh, there are earthquakes produced along this fault, and they are deadly really, really uh, bad earthquakes produced along this fault in Turkey. So this is a, a surface expression, as you can see here, this escarpment of the fault. Now here, this what this photograph uh, shows, it shows you a typical normal fault, yeah, a typical normal fault. And you see the, 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 the uh, fault plane uh, like this, steeply inclined. And this is a foot wall, and this is a hanging wall, and the hanging wall goes down relative to the foot wall. Yeah. Um, so you, it's kind of obvious, obvious here. Now, if you look in this, uh, in this uh, afloimento uh, again, you see a normal fault. Yeah, and you see the beds here. You see the beds, um, and basically what happens is it says the beds uh, in the hanging wall are displaced downwards. Note the fractures, small faults and joints in the thick bed that are parallel to the main fault. 
So for instance, here you see fractures, yeah? Here, here. Um, so you, you see the fault is somewhere here, yeah? And what happens is you see that there is a zone affected by fractures, yeah? That's the idea. Sorry, the fault is here. You can see it here. Uh, typically, you see that this is basically a fault zone because I can see a fault here as well. Anyway, just real examples, the different scales of observation. Now, let's have a, a look. If we, if we could go in the field, uh, normally, if we were living in normal times, we would be able to have a field trip to go and look for real at these structures here in the Andes somewhere. Uh, so if we if we had the field trip, what do you do? It go to uh, some Afroimantos. And this ties in with Gabriel's question. And then in during the field trip, we would we would do some elements of mapping. Yeah. So I uh, I would be able to teach you how to map and how to observe things, but we cannot do it now. The idea in the department is that when when the university will allow field trips, maybe we will be able to set up a field school where we can have all the students who want from all these semesters when we couldn't have field trips. So it, maybe we can have a, a big field school and maybe with several disciplines, maybe like uh, I and some of my colleagues could be somewhere, uh, uh, we, we uh, decide on a location and we can see various geological aspects. So this is something that we are discussing. So hopefully uh, some of you will be uh, willing to join us when we will be able to do it. But now we can't because, not because we don't want, we want very much, but we are not allowed to. So uh, by the uh, university management, and I understand their reasons. So if we were to go in the field, let's say we would, we would look at an outcrop and I would ask you to, do, to draw a sketch so that you develop your capacity of observation of, of basically uh, capturing what is important in the observations you make in an afloimento. So here is an example of what can be done. You see this normal fault, you see it here, yeah? So and you see what a geologist sees, yeah? So you see, it's a fault zone here. So the fault zone, you see here, he cannot define just one surface. He sees a zone that is affected by this. This is a fault zone. And another interesting fa uh, fact you, you can see, you, you see that the layers here, they bend, and we call this drag, yeah, drag. And you can imagine, uh, because of the movement, what the mechanics is, these layers kind of bend. So we, there is some sort of ductile at the at the outcrop scale for our eyes, like ductile information. Exactly, Gabriel. Now, ductile, it looks to us because it doesn't lose cohesion. But if we go there and look, we'll see many brittle structures. There is no plastic deformation here at the surface. And then what they saw, if they look, they, you, you can see this these gray lines and they see they see joints yeah they see joints so they kind of show that we have joints yeah in these layers we talked about joints and here in this he, he said displacement but now we'll see very very shortly what kind of displacement is this is it the fault really moved just you know like this and then in this vertical outcrop we can see the displacement or maybe the fault was oblique, but we see only this vertical component. Yeah, so we don't know that. Yeah, so this is one aspect that in structural geology, we have to learn to think about things in 3D. All right, I'll show you in a bit some diagrams. Let's, let's have a, a look at uh, some, a, a couple of um, other examples. This one, again, an outcrop, yeah, an outcrop, and it seems kind of strange. You see this dipping dipping layers but you see this layer and, and this one they seem to be the same yeah the same uh, rock and indeed uh, here is where the fault is yeah you see the fault 
Now, uh, the source, you see what the geologist sees. So if we were to go in the field, I would ask you to try to draw some sketches. It's not to, to see if you can do it or not, but it's just to learn. Yeah, so just to learn how to do it. So the idea is that what a geologist sees, you see the important thing. So he, he puts here bedding, yeah, bedding, and this is a fault surface, which we can see it here. Now he says thrust fault. Now I would use if if this is what the the uh, layers were dipping initially, and then the fault happened. I would say it's a reverse fault because the angle is steep. But maybe the layers were initially horizontal, as they should have been. The fault happened, and then the whole thing got dipped. And then initially it was a thrust fault, a low angle reverse. Yeah. So let's let's trust what they say here, because they, they might know more about the geologic history from our observations here. All right, so this is, this is the idea. And you see here, it's a notebook, and he said notebook, because this is the scale of observation. And this is very important. I'll show you something here. Here, when we look at this, I don't see a marker, I don't see something, usually, People, when they take these photographs, they put a geologic hammer or a person stands in front of the afflorimento so that you know what the scale is. Yeah. Now, the geologist, when he drew, he said about two meters is like this because he's in the field and he knows what it is, two meters. We can see some trees here, so we can have an idea how big this uh, outcrop is. But here, in these figures here that I've shown you, we don't have here. Uh, something that gives us the scale, like here, which is not normal. Like in geology, it's important to have the scale. It's very important. Here we can we can realize. You see, we see vegetation, so maybe these are trees here. So obviously, this is in the distance. But these are close up of outcrops, but we don't know what is one meter or you know less or something like this. So this is for you to know that this geologist is a very good observer. So he didn't forget to, to put the notebook so that people know what the scale is here. All right. Now let's have a, a look at a spectacular fault. <laughs> this is a very, very famous fault, even more famous than the North Anatolian fault. And this is the San Andreas fault in California, which is a trans um, a tran transform fault. Yeah. And we'll learn what the transform fault is. But uh, mechanically speaking, it is a strike slip fault. So it is a, a strike slip fault means horizontal movement of one block relative to the other. You can imagine the fault as being vertical, the fault plane. Um, and as you can see, this is a stream, yeah, like a river. This is a channel, the valley of the stream. And you can see how it was displaced by the movement along this fault. So if there were no fault, this probably would have gone, this segment would have continued here. But because you have this movement, this shows you the displacement. Now, something about strike slip faults, this one, we call it dextral. Dextral means right, uh, movement to the right. Sinistral means movement to the left. So if you sit on this block, or on this block, and look at the other block, if the movement of the other block is to the right, then it's a dextral strike slip fault. If it were to the left, then it's a, a sinistral strike slip fault. Now, if you were to go here, let's say you go here and look at this block here, you would see this block having moved to the right. So no matter on which block, you, uh, on which side of the fault you, you, you are, you see the other block as having uh, uh, relatively been moved to the right. Yeah. So this is a geologist looks at this and represents a fault here. Yeah, the fault zone, and shows the the sense of movement, which is dextral. You see what happened with the with the creek bed here and so on. Now, as you can see, it says North American plate here and Pacific plate here. So San Andreas fault is a transform fault it is it's a plate boundary fault when we talk about plate tectonics 
we, we learn about this in the tectonics part of the course, which is way more interesting. And um, the San Andreas Fault, it's also a big headache. Uh, as you know, there have been uh, earthquakes in California, some of them deadly. And uh, a lot of research has been done uh, on this fault as, uh, since the American universities uh, put a lot of money into research and so on. So there is a huge literature uh, that uh, analyzed and discussed this fault. Uh, I don't know what you are referring to, Gabriel, with left and upward. Uh, but I mean, here we don't have, um, if you refer to a location here or not. Hello, teacher. Yes, no, not properly to this picture, but for example, I mean, uh, sometimes, uh, for example, you have a, a plane fault. Uh, yes. Uh, and for example, some, some blocks, uh, uh, one block, which could be, for example, move upward like yes. a normal fault yes. and also a, a, have a, a strike slip of com component yes so yes. when this happened uh how could we call this uh, oblique oblique fault oblique I'll, fault. I'll, I'll show you in a bit yeah just okay. so i've shown you real examples and uh, also, as you, Gabriel, asked me about mapping and all these things, so just tried to compensate a bit to show you, you know, what a mapper or observations uh, are in the field. So now, now um, let's, uh, Gabriel anticipated a bit, yeah? So let's look at these uh, situations. So this one, we have only a deep slip component. So you see, uh, along the dip of the fault plane, the movement of this block, this is a normal one. Now, if you hit, see the hanging wall block moving up relative to the foot wall, we call this, normally we call it a reverse fault, yeah? A, re, a reverse fault. Now, low angle reverse faults are called thrust faults, yeah? So, I'll tell you in a bit, but let, let me just go and then we'll, we'll discuss about this. So. The three very simple examples, like the end members, yeah? The end members are normal, reverse, and strike slip like here, which could be dextral or right lateral, as you can see. You, you sit here and the other block moves to the right. You sit here, the other block moves to the right. Or, or sinistral or left lateral, yeah? So these are strike slip. Now, Gabriel's question was what happens if we combine this? strike slip with uh, deep slip. And obviously, here is oblique slip, yeah? And depending on the situation, you can say, well, it's a sinistral normal fault. So the normal word refers to the movement along the deep, and sinistral refers to the movement along the strike, yeah? So uh, you, you can say, if you want to be very precise, a sinistral normal fault like this one or sinistral reverse, yeah? So all these combinations, um, dextral normal, dextral reverse. Yeah, so these are oblique slip. Or you can have situations which are even more complex, like rotational fault. Now you, you see, like, like the, the displacement vector is not the same because it has a center of rotation, yeah? So you can have this, all these patients or combinations of them. Now, here is the comment I wanted to make. Um, if the, the, the fault, if, it, if it's less than 30 degrees, in the literature, you, they are called low angle faults, low angle, less than 30 degrees relative to the horizontal. If they are more than 60 degrees, between 90 and 60 degrees, those are steep, steep faults, yeah? Yeah, so uh, lo when you say low angle or steep, you know you are either less than 30 or more than 60. Now, here is something, and we'll get into a bit of tectonics again. I, I told you, you like this because we have more geology now. I like it. Um, so, uh, if there is a reverse fault, so reverse fault means the hanging uh, wall block goes up relative to the foot wall. So, if, if it's a reverse fault, and if it's low angle, so less than 30 degrees, Normally, we call this thrust faults. 
yeah? And uh, the term is applied very much in tectonics when we talk about faults that have displacement, thrust faults, very low angle faults, with displacements of tens or hundreds of kilometers, believe it or not. I'll show you an example in a bit. All right, so let's talk a bit more about terminology so that you, you, you know the terminology. Uh, these are basic terms. I'm giving you the basic terms so that you can read literature, geological literature, yeah? This type of fault, this type of fault, what happens here? The dip along the fault plane changes, yeah? The dip changes, you see. This type of fault is called a listric fault. Listric, this is um, the word. And this is, uh, normally you, you can, you have a listric fault and they typically have normal faults. So the hanging wall block goes down like this. Now, uh, it, they exist, the other ones, but, but normally they are uh, normal, normal faults. Um, and you can see what happens here in this part of the fault, you can call this a high angle fault because it's more than 60 degrees. But here, because it changed the curve, uh, the, the deep, yeah, and it, it's curved, here the fault becomes a low angle fault. Now, me mechanically, when you, when you do this, I'll show you what happens when you have listric faults, because mechanically, uh, everything has to adjust itself. Yeah, you have deformation. We'll see what the deformation is. Now, another type of uh, geometry that we can discuss about is this type of geometry called ramp flat ramp geometry. Ramp flat, ramp flat, and so on. Now, you can imagine, imagine that you have the layers like this, the geologic layers, and the fault that is going to develop here is going to have this geometry. So in the end, yeah, the, after the deformation and displacement, you can see here the flats and the ramps and the flats. And when we talk about um, fold and thrust belts in the tectonic part of the course, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this geometry, yeah? But for the time being, just remember what this means, yeah? In your mind, the image. Remember about this. All right, now, again, terminology. You see, we, I'm still discussing terminology here. Uh, very basic, very important for future, for tectonics, for your professional life. Imagine two normal faults, and they are oriented like this. So the, if you have two normal faults oriented like this, um, this block will go down, and this this structure that you see is called a graben. Yeah, uh, a, 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 a graben. A, a, the word comes from German, that means like a trough. Yeah, like a, like a, a kind of a valley in in this sense. So a graben means this half graben is the, the term used for the situation you have only one of these faults and you see what happens. So basically what happens, you see this, this block basically bent, bent to accommodate uh, this movement, yeah, this movement along this fault. So it bent here. And when it bent, some faults uh, related to this deformation uh, in addition to the master fault here, developed, yeah, the, the master of the main fault, and some faults developed, you can see them here. Now, if the faults that developed here in this deformed uh, block, if the, these faults are parallel, yeah, to the main fault, they are called synthetic. And they are not parallel, they are dipping in the other direction, like these ones, they are called antithetic. Now, I know it, it is a lot for you, uh, but I have to give you this because you will find all these terms in the geology, uh, geological literature, because we use terms so that people understand what we describe. Yeah, we describe the geology of a certain area. So you have to, to, to have the um, vocabulary, which are the instruments to convey the idea. All right, so, and, <laughs> all right. Um, and uh, if the normal faults dip in opposite ways, what will happen? This block will go down, this block will go down, and you have a block that stays up. 
and this is called the Horst. Again, comes from ge the German language. Uh, so Horst Graben, when we'll discuss about extensional tectonics, the formation of rifts, for instance, and what happens on the continents, this this uh, basically st uh, this uh, structural style with horses and gravels, for instance. Um, so here we are uh, putting the foundation, yeah, for us to to talk about tectonics. All right. Now this is very interesting. I told you that I'm gonna tell you about thrust faults, so low angle reverse faults, low angle less than 30 degrees with displacements of tens or, or hundreds of kilometers. Now, how do you think the Cordillera Oriental here is here when these rocks at some point were at the bottom of the sea? There, there were masses, masses of layers, yeah, of the upper continental crust that were thrust, yeah, sheets, if you want, one on top of the other. This is how the fold and thrust belts of the origins form. And believe it or not, these masses will travel for tens or hundreds of kilometers, one on top of the other. How this happens mechanically, what force you need to have for this to happen. Now, this is why we learned about the fluid pressure and what happens that the fluid pressure reduces the effective stress. And that's why you can actually have movement, yeah, because of the reduced effective stress, because there are fluids there that help this happen. But anyway, let's look at the technology here. This part, this, these layers that were taken, that, uh, that were moved along a, a low angle thrust fault on top of other layers, yeah, uh, these layers are called the alochton. Alochton means foreign. Foreign because it comes from another part. The layers that form the foot wall of the thrust fault, these layers here, the white ones, they are called autochton because they are in place. <laughs> they, are, uh, they haven't moved, they are there where they were from the beginning. So you have alochton and autochton. These are words that come from the old Greek language. Now, you will encounter the term para-autochton, para-autochton, which means that it is, it moved a bit, but not too much, yeah? It's almost in place. Now, what happens, imagine all this thrust sheet, we call this a thrust sheet. All this came on top, yeah, of the autochton, Yes, it is a hanging wall. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Damn it. So the alochton in this case is the is uh, uh, obviously the hanging wall, but it's a very low angle reverse fault. Yeah. So it's the alochton. That's right. Uh, the hanging wall. So imagine all this came up to here, but then with geologic time, parts of alochton were removed by erosion. You see, these were removed by erosion. So what happens, you might have here uh, a rise, a rise of the autochton, and here there is a, a, a bit left of the alochton, yeah? So when the whole sheet came, it came up to here. But, but now there is only this piece that is left, and it, we call it a clipper, yeah? Now, the same can happen inside this thrust sheet inside this alochton, you see that you can have erosion here and you get a window. So when you read about the win a certain window in the Alps, yeah, you talk about, uh, you read about the Alps in Europe, for instance, and the window with a certain name, that's what it means. Yeah, you in the window, the autochton is exposed, but it's surrounded by alochton. Yeah, so these are terms that you will find in the geological literature. Now, if you were to take, if you were to take a cross section, yeah, a cross section from here to here, this is what you'd see, yeah, in a, in a vertical cross section. 
So in geology, we have maps and we have cross sections. So you, what you see, you see the clipper here, you see the allochthonous rocks here, you see the window here and so on. So all these clippers and windows and so on, if you go to the Alps, to Switzerland, Germany, uh, Austria, you will encounter these things. So now you can see it was a continuous sheet, but then there was erosion. Yeah, there was erosion that happened. Um, again, there is here a, a statement. I want you to, to consider it and think about it. It said the minimum displacement here, at least the displacement here is defined by the farthest distance between the outcrops, thrust outcrops in the clipper and window. What it means, the minimum displacement is from here to here. That means if you have here allochton and below it it's autochton, that means that all this thing moved at least from here to here. Now, if you were to drill here, you'd see that the displacement was even further. And these things move for tens or hundreds of kilometers. It's really impressive what happens on our planet, really impressive. So now I, I, I've shown you this, I'm gonna show you a real life example. Now, you, you, when you go to the United States, you might want to go to West, uh, the Western United States because it's really nice in terms of geology. It's great geology, great geology. And you can go to their na national parks. And one of them is the Glacier National Park in the state of Montana, very close to the uh, border with Canada, with Alberta. So here you have a very famous example of a thrust sheet. Yeah, it's a, called the uh, Lewis thr thrust. Lewis thrust. In cross section, it looks like this. Yeah, in cross section, it looks like this. You can see all this section. Yeah, all this section star, uh, uh, of Precambrian um, Precambrian age rocks being thrust on top of Mesozoic, you see Cretaceous rocks. So young rocks versus old rocks. The old rocks were thrust on top of the young rocks. And here you have an example of a clipper and it's called the Chief Mountain. You see it here very nicely sitting. And uh, uh, here again, some clipper, and you see here uh, the autochtone is exposed, and then is the allochtone, yeah, the allochtone. So chief mountain, very scenic, uh, but this is Aboriginal land. Yeah, it's Aboriginal land in the same way like we in America del Sur, we have um you know uh, the the populations that were here before uh, the conquistadors came so this is aboriginal land and chief mountain is considered a sacred mountain by the um by the nation the aboriginal nation that inhabits these lands so normally they would not allow people to go and climb it and so on because it's sacred yeah for them so this is where we as geologists, we have to be very aware of the cultural sensitivities. A lot of damage has been done on all continents. In Australia, it's horrible, yeah? You know that the aboriginals in Australia have been treated very badly and their uh, sacred sites have been desecrated and so on. And in many instances by geologists who didn't even know. Uh, when they know and they do it on purpose, then it's even worse. Yeah, so that's the idea. Uh, now let's go a, a bit further about faults. You see, faults are very interesting. Now, when you look at the fault surface, you might see that it is polished, like here. Now, this is in San Francisco. You go to a park in San Francisco, and uh, you see this. This is a fault surface. So this this type of polished surface. Uh, as a result of the movement, yeah, uh, along this surface, is called the silicon side, yeah, silicon side, the the fault plane with a, a polished surface. Now it has, as you can see, it has some grooves, yeah, some striations, yeah, and these striations, yeah, imagine you have these blocks of rock and they grind one against the other, 
So there will be asperities, yeah? They, they are not perfect. So there are asperities that scratch, scratch the surface of the fold, yeah? So we call these silicon lines. You can see the silicon lines here, these grooves here. And here, if you were to look carefully, you might see some crystals of calcite, for instance, that have grown during the fold movement. There is a solution there, and these crystals grow. I'll show you in detail what it looks like, uh, and they are called silicon fibers. Yeah. So these are typical elements of a fold plane. Now, here is an, another example. This is from a mine. You see a mine. And this mine, basically, uh, as you can see, the smooth rock surface in the foreground is a fault surface. So this is a silicon site, yeah? And now what happens is the straight line trace uh, of a second parallel fault is evident right above the tunnel. So what happens, you have a fault plane here, and this is here another probably fold perpendicular to this one here. But the, here you see the fold plane is displaced. This, this is a fold plane. Here is another fold plane here, yeah? Here, very interesting. And these are the, the uh, slick side. Um, so you see they developed the tunnel, the, 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 um, the tunnel in the foot wall block. So this is a hanging wall block and this is a foot wall block, yeah? Very interesting. Example here, look at, at this fold from uh, Norway. Yeah, the, the normal. So you can see the silicon side polished surface with silicon lines. You can see them very nicely here, all these groups. Now, here, this in, is in Norway, in uh, the Caledonites in Europe. Now, you see in Utah, Utah, a lot of sedimentary layers, uh, but very good for George. You see, uh, the uh, ge geological field school here, they look at this fault surface here with the grooves, yeah, with the striated fault surface here. All right, so hopefully we'll be able to to have a field uh, field school, uh, and we'll be able to go and look at some structures as well here in Colombia, uh, which has great geology, by the way. Now. Here is what the silicon fibers are, yeah? So you see the calcite crystals, how they grew, yeah? How they grew here. So you see these steps, these steps. And now what happens, these crystals, they are elongated in the direction of the fault movement. So here, if you look at the direction of these of this, uh, uh, silicon fibers, it's like this, and then it changed. So you can reconstruct the complex history of movement along this fold, yeah, of movement along this fold in time by looking at these silicon fibers. And if you put your hand and you feel these steps, yeah, the dire direction of movement is this way, yeah, the steps, they end towards the direction of movement, yeah. So that's the fold initially moved like this and then like that. All right, so you see how we start, we, we learn some things, they are dry, they are, but now we start thinking about understanding the geologic history. All right, so here is the complications, yeah? <laughs> well, um, it's not that I want them to be complicated, but imagine this block goes down relative to this block. And these points were initially together. You see this layer, the continuation of this layer. This is basically the displacement vector, yeah? The displacement vector is oblique. So this is an oblique fold, as Gabriel pointed out. So it has two components, a deep component, movement along the deep of this plane, and the strike component, you can see it, all right? So here, this angle between this um, strike here and the displacement vector is called pitch or rake, yeah, this angle here. So it shows you in which direction was the displacement vector. Now, let's take, let's take a section, a section which is like this, yeah? So uh, C, C, 
uh, it says profile perpendicular to the fault strike. So this is a fault strike, and we take a profile through this point perpendicular to the strike here, yeah? And this is shown in C. So imagine this was the image I've shown you of that afloimento, yeah, with the normal fault. And what we see here, we see a separation in the vertical plane here, perpendicular to the strike. This is the deep separation, but it's not the total displacement. Yeah, it's just this. We see only this in this plane. So that's why in geology, you always have to think, what am I looking at? Yeah, that's why we have to reconstruct in 3D what happens. And you see some names for these components, horizontal and vertical, of the deep separation. Now, if we were to take another section, vertical section, but which goes through these two points, which were initially together, which is section two here, yeah, like, like this, then what we will see here, we will see the true displacement vector because it goes right through it, right through it, this section. So imagine when we look in an afloimento, are we looking at a section like this or are we looking at a section like this? So this is something we have to figure out. <laughs> it's not always very simple, but I'm just saying that's why geologists, when they go and do mapping, they have first to do the observations they can and then integrate and put together and understand the geometry. And mapping itself should be a separate course. Gabriel asked me if we are going to discuss about mapping. Well, like, what can I tell you in you know one class? I would I would need a course actually to do mapping because mapping is a discipline in itself. Yeah. So think about this, like like the geometry. If you were to to project this layer up like this, so that you project this down faulted block here to the surface. This is what this B shows, yeah? It shows this projection of this here would be the horizontal separation. So in 3D, things become more complex because we have the, the layers dipping in a certain direction, the fault plane in a different direction. You can see this and we have all these elements, but our human mind tries to break it into elements that we can understand. We can break the displacement vector into a deep separation, a strike separation. We have this angle and so on. All right, so in a nutshell, I'm giving you what you need as a foundation to think about the complexity of movement along the faults. All right, now, fault anatomy, yeah, anatomy. So it, sometimes the fault can be just the fault plane as we, we've seen. Yeah, with the slick and sides, but not always. Yeah, not always. It's just a fault plane. Um, so let's let's have in general uh, what a fault would look like. So it, it would have a part that we call the core or a slip surface. Yeah. So the central fault core. Yeah. So this is the zone of the most intense deformation, most intense. So it can be a slip surface, just the slip surface. Imagine we have a joint and it's favorably oriented. And because of the stress situation during the geologic history, at some point, there is slip along the joint plane. Yeah. So the, here the fault would have basically this uh, slip surface, but you can have several slip surfaces. So you have like a, 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 a fault zone. Yeah. Um, you can have several slip surface or just a, a zone uh, of intense shear uh, deformation. You, you cannot see very well the slip surfaces. There are many, many, many when you look microscopically, yeah? So this is the, the, the core. Now, around the core, you have something that's called the damage zone. And the damage zone, as you can see, is a zone, yeah, a volume of rock that has been affected by brittle deformation. So uh, slip, slip fractures, um, uh, little faults formed in the damage zone, yeah, associated with this main fault, yeah. So this is a zone where there is damage in the volume of rock, yeah. So you have brittle deformation structures in that zone that have been developed 
associated with movement along this fold. So look, the, I think this is from textbook, but it's great. Some people do these studies. So if you become a structural geologist, they did a profile. So they started looking uh, very carefully at the rock here. To our eyes, it looks the same rock. You see the fold here, yeah? You, you see the fold. So uh, here, this is something homogeneous to our eyes. But if you go and look carefully and take samples and so on, so as they moved meters from the fold core here, fold core, yeah? So as they moved, they, they looked at how many fractures they can see, yeah? How much brittle deformation they can see in the volume of rock here. And basically they, they built a frequency diagram of, they had a, a systematic method of counting the fractures. And suddenly, like 15 meters from the fold core, they saw this. Now, this is the damage zone. This is the zone that was heavily influenced by the uh, deformation along this fold. Yeah. So that's the idea of the of the damage zone. And then you have a zone, as you can see here, which is called the drug zone, uh, and it appears ductile to us, where you see the layers being bent. Yeah. So being affected even beyond beyond the core. You don't have a fold surface here. Um, but still, there is a zone where there is this influence. So there is the formation. Yeah. So that's the idea. This is a drug zone. All right. So here is an example. Um, an example, we have a listric fold. You see it changes the dip. It is curved. And you have, um, <laughs> you have a fold bend. So this is a bend in the fold. And then you have a fold. A fold so the the layers fold it yeah so uh, it's like the reverse of drag here when they fold it uh, like here due to the the formation along this you can see the damage zone here so you can see synthetic synthetic folds these red ones and antithetic folds being developed in here yeah so someone mapped them <coughs> so just as an example all right, so again, if we were to look at strain, do you remember about strain ellipses? So you can, you, you see here, there is no deformation in the layer, yeah? And the, the strain ellipse is a sphere. As you approach the fold, yeah? As you approach the fold, look what happens to these circles. They become ellipses more and more elongated. So this is a drag, yeah, the drag. All right. Now, Let's look at these examples of drag. Yeah, so th this is in, in the case of a of a um, reverse fold, in the case of a normal fold. So mechanically, it makes sense. We'll, we've seen this example, yeah, of a listric fold. The fold has a bend and leads to the folding of these layers with the development of synthetic and antithetic folds in here. And here is an example due to the to this dipping. Yeah, this orientation of these layers as opposed to here. Yeah, it explains here in this particular situation, if the cutoff line of the bedding, this is the cutoff lines, make a small angle with the displacement di direction on the fold surface, the formation of drag folds is less likely. So they don't form because you see mechanically, uh, mechanically they form because these layers are you see fast, horizontal and so on. Here they are vertical, yeah? So they won't form drag folds, yeah? That's the idea. All right, now, displacement. So displacement vector. You can think, okay, this fold here has this displacement vector, but it's the same everywhere. <clears throat> well, how long? I mean, we cannot go to the infinite, yeah? So this fault has to start somewhere and end somewhere. And the, this is hard to intuitively understand because obviously you would imagine as you translate things, you would imagine that it's the same thing everywhere, but no, typically the faults in 3D would look like this, yeah, would look like this. So this is basically the, the fault uh, that has a tip line, yeah? And the, the tip line is a margin. 
the margin basically of the zone that was affected uh, of the fault core. Yeah. And if you are at the surface of the earth here, you'd see the tip point, yeah, the margins, it's the intersection of the tip line and the surface here. And what happens, the displacement, as you see, it's zero here because the fault has to start somewhere and end somewhere. So there is no displacement, there is no fault beyond it. So it's zero displacement. But then as you go, yeah, in the middle of, of this area, there is the maximum displacement, as you can see. So if you were to do a profile uh, uh, here at the surface of the displacement, you'd see it's zero here, zero here, and it increases towards the center, you see, like this. And if, if you are to look at the same, at, at the whole fault plane, yeah, you see these concentric ISO lines, yeah, uh, showing equal displacement. So the, the largest displacement is here in the center. Zero displacement is here where the fault starts, yeah. So this is what all this show to you, yeah. This gradual uh, change in the displacement from the margins of the fault towards the central point. All right. Now, here is because now you know about displacement, you know about the uh, anatomy of a fault, like fault core and damage zone. People observed something interesting. There is this correlation. You can see uh, these positive correlations between first the damage zone thickness and the fault displacement. So this tells you that the more displacement you have on a fault, the larger will be the damage zone. And the more displacement you have on a fault, the thicker will be the fault core. Quite interesting, huh? When you come to think about it. So, so small faults that had just a bit of displacement, they are very limited. Big faults like San Andreas, North Anatolian fault, with hundreds of kilometers of displacement, they will have big damage zones. Yeah. So that's very interesting. We learn about how the work, uh, how the earth works. Now, fault formation. Yeah, just very briefly, fault formation. Think about it. Um, it's not a very simple process. I mean, we we gave the uh, bay, uh, the foundation in terms of rock mechanics, but you can imagine. You remember about the micro fractures. So you have initially in any volume you have micro fractures. Yeah, and the micro fractures will form and eventually uh, connect. Yeah. Um, and also, do you have a pre-existing discontinuity like a joint? If you have, then you already have a surface along which a displacement can occur, and then you'll have less of a damage zone, for instance. Yeah. So this, this depends on the conditions. Um, you see, if you have highly porous rocks like sandstones and so on, you form initially the formation band zones. We talked about the formation band. So you have different situations that lead to fall formation. But what is in the end happening? What is in the end happening? It says here um, that initially, before the fault forms, you have a process zone. So the process zone is the zone where we cannot see initially how all these micro fractures they link one to another, they, they link, yeah? And eventually a fault forms, yeah, through this linkage of these micro fractures. So initially when you start forming a fault, you have a process zone that is being developed. This is where the fault will be with uh, uh, these linkages are established. And suddenly they link up and you have, and you have, faulting you have displacement yeah and then the process zone around this surface along which there was displacement the process zone becomes a damage zone this is a zone where you had all these micro fractures being developed and trying to link one to another some were successful some not and so on so that's a damage zone and then after the slip the damage zone keeps growing. You, you have the stress that kind of uh, creates this uh, development, yeah? And 
you have a growth of the damage zone, and then you have again slip and so on. So the, the fault formation is not a very simple process. I just want to intuitively give you an idea that that's why we have a volume of rock involved in this uh, growth process. Yeah, that you can read and this will make sense. Um, now, here is something, don't worry, it, it looks very abstract, but it links the idea of faults and earthquakes. And the idea is there are two mechanisms that uh, faults can grow, uh, uh, can use to grow. One is called stick slip. That means you have stress built up and suddenly it falls, it, it fails, yeah? Stress built up, it, there is displacement. And then there is again stress built up and displacement and so on. So this is a mechanism called stick slip, yeah? And when there is sudden displacement, you have earthquakes. So the stress builds up up to the point where the differential stress is large enough for failure and then failure happens. And then the stress builds up and there is failure and so on. And in terms of displacement, when you have failure, there is displacement. When you have stress buildup, there is no displacement. Failure and then stress buildup and so on. So this is a model that is used, believe it or not, to understand the occurrence of earthquakes. Actually, this is what we think happens and creates uh, that has stick. Yeah, I don't really understand David uh, the question if there is a place. Yes, all these faults like San Andreas, North Anatolia, and all these faults along which there are earthquakes, this is where stick slip happens. But there are also faults that <laughs> yes that have stable sliding. Yeah, or it's called aseismic slip because. Sli uh, it, it, they don't create earthquakes. It's like continuous, very slow, very, very slow sliding. And, and basically imagine in sedimentary rocks, porous, yeah, uh, close to the surface, there is more stable sliding. If you have uh, uh, fault surfaces that have clay, yeah, the, the, the clay promotes stable sliding, yeah. Then when you get to the brittle plastic transition, again, stable sliding, you have plastic, uh, you have these processes of plastic deformation taking over, yeah? So, so uh, stable sliding. So keeping in mind these two possibilities, here we learn something about our earth. There is an upper section of the crust, yeah? It says very top of the crust, upper kilometer or, or two, they, you don't have many earthquakes here because typically, typically the slip here is stable or aseismic. And then you have a zone where the, the slip on faults is by the stick slip mechanism. And this is the seismogenic zone. And then at the brittle plastic transition, there is again stable sliding. So it's aseismic. So what is interesting here is that we have a zone which is mainly, in most cases, responsible for the earthquakes yeah, in the crust. And above it and below it, the earthquakes don't happen, except for the plate margins, where is a different situation. But we, we talk about continental crust, yeah, several continental crust. So this is called the seismogenic zone. You can see it typically, yeah? You, you, you see, it goes down to about 15 kilometers. Now, another thing, and we'll, we are done, yeah? Uh, it says that um, when an earthquake happens, yeah? How much is the displacement? A few meters, can be one meter. Uh, in the largest earthquakes, 10 to 15 meters in one event. But when we look at these big faults, they, they, they have displacements of kilometers. What that means is that there were hundreds of earthquakes that led to that cumulative displacement. Yeah. So the big faults like San Andreas, North Antonio, so hundreds of earthquakes, they are recurring. Yeah. And they are very dangerous as well. 
And finally, finally, just I'll, I'll, I'll be done in a bit, so we won't exceed the time. I want you to think about this for the future in tectonics. So you talk about this. So look at the normal folding. You see these layers? Look at the normal folding. What it does? Uh, yes. <laughs> well, Gabriel, <laughs> if you are hungry, you can see you can see here uh, a sandwich, definitely. Um, so the idea is, uh, or maybe you looked at the seis uh, seismic zone. No, no problem. So the idea is, the normal faulting, as you can see, leads to extension. Yeah. So when we talk about extensional regimes, like in the rifts. Yeah, that's why we have normal faulting there. And when we talk about thrusts, reverse faults, yeah, we talk about contractional regimes, and con contractional regimes lead to shortening. Yeah. So, so look at look at extensional faulting. So a region that suffers extension versus a region that suffers uh, contraction. So here you have a zone of that eventually leads to a rift. Yeah. Uh, and here this leads to an origin, all right? So this is the idea, what faulting does. And the last, absolutely last slide, some of you will become explorationists, will become exploration geologists, and will look for oil, for minerals, yeah, mineral deposits, and you will drill, you will drill. So remember what faults do to the normal sequences of rocks. Look at this reverse fault. This reverse fault will double, will repeat the section. So if you drill like this, think about it. You might think, oh, we have limestone, then we have some shells, then we have again limestone. Oh, we have four layers. No, actually you have just two layers, but they are repeated because of a fault, yeah? or you can have a normal fault and you might happen to drill in such a situation and you don't encounter this layer and you wonder, wow, I was looking exactly for this layer, where it is. Yeah, <laughs> um, so, so keep in mind these complications. You can imagine uh, we can have a much more complex situation, but that's why structural geologists have to study this and have to to train themselves into all the details so that they can understand the complexity. So this is it for today. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Please, please read these things. So I would say it will take you maybe half an hour to read this, uh, maybe 45 minutes to read this. So give it two hours. Yeah, please read this. So study, give, uh, assign two hours to understand what we discussed in this class with what we discussed in the previous classes as well we'll have a, a test on thursday all right so this is it if you have questions i'm uh, more than willing to answer them if you don't uh, have a great afternoon yeah and feliz tarde nos vemos uh, jueves don't forget again jueves i am with you during the normal class time on Webex. I'm waiting for you. If you have questions, come and ask me. Yeah. Come and ask me or call me or write me by WhatsApp, whatever you want. All right. So thank you very much. Take care.